every person can inadvertently get carried away with something, and so much that they lose touch with reality. Can you blame a person for this? I don't know, but I do know that my wife is very attracted to her boss. I was staring at my computer screen when she walked into the den. She had been coming home late from work for quite some time now, and tonight was no different. It was almost ten o'clock. The kids and I had already eaten dinner and finished their homework. They had been in bed for nearly an hour. They didn't even ask about their mother anymore or why she wasn't home yet. That was a recent change, and it hurt me deeply. I had spent the last hour going over our finances. Over the past two years, things had gotten significantly worse. Our income had taken a major hit, though my wife didn't seem to notice. She was still spending like we didn't have a care in the world. I had just finished paying the latest round of bills. We might be able to stretch things for a couple more months. I had also been reevaluating my life plan. Maybe I had made a mistake. For the past two years, I'd felt like I was watching a ticking time bomb, unsure if or when it would finally go off. I had always thought it would eventually, but now I was starting to wonder if it ever would. I don't know how long she stood there watching me. I'd been getting lost in my own thoughts more often lately, losing track of time as a result. Finally, with her arms crossed and that all-too-familiar look of disdain on her face, she spoke. Michael, I want a divorce. I'm not entirely sure what I felt in that moment. My spirit was so weighed down by self-doubt and loathing that I was almost numb to any new emotions. It wasn't really funny, but I still found myself holding back a laugh. My wife of seventeen years had just told me it was over, that everything we'd built together was about to be torn apart. It was an emotion I hadn't felt in a long time, and it almost made me smile. Relief. I looked at her for a moment, allowing myself one last brief journey to our happier times. Then I snapped back to reality. Okay. I was a better programmer than a manager. But as things go, programmers tend to get promoted to project leaders, then department heads, and eventually into senior management. That's how I found myself as the senior manager of product development, a title that was really just a dressed-up version of salesman. At the time, I was the most qualified for the role. I had practically created our flagship product on my own, nurtured it through its early stages, and guided it through six major updates. I knew our product inside out. When customers had questions, I had the answers. When the team faced issues, I could solve them. With a new haircut and an expensive suit, I definitely looked the part. The pay raise and perks that came with the promotions weren't bad either. I'd say I was mostly satisfied with my job, but my true passion was programming and I missed it deeply. Unfortunately, my role didn't allow for that anymore. There were just too many meetings and calls to find time for coding. Instead, I had to watch a new generation of bright-eyed developers showing off their latest innovations. Don't get me wrong, being in charge had its perks, but I always wished my responsibilities were a bit different. So it wasn't exactly shocking when I got fired from Chicago Technology Solutions. Honestly, if I'd been my own boss, I'd have done the same. My attendance at meetings was spotty, and I missed too many deadlines. At the time, I wasn't actively trying to get fired, but I certainly wasn't trying hard to keep my job either. I'd been in a slump for a while. It took me about three months to shake off the initial depression and try to move on, but that attempt didn't go well either. Another month passed before I found a solution to my situation. At least one I could live with. If it weren't for the kids, I think I would have lost my mind. Their steady routine helped me regain some control. Breakfast, school, snack, homework, dinner, bed. Breakfast, school, snack, homework, dinner, bed. 
That became my mantra and slowly helped me get back on track. I threw myself into being a full-time stay-at-home dad, taking over all the housework and driving the kids around. They loved having me around more, and that helped me realize I still had worth. I wasn't completely useless after all. If my wife noticed this shift in our family dynamics, she never mentioned it. I'm almost certain she didn't even realize it happened. I met Jennifer Riley at a fraternity mixer, an event I almost skipped. I had joined the fraternity not for the parties but for the opportunities it would create after graduation. My grades were stellar, but in every other way I was pretty average. My height, weight, appearance, and personality were all unremarkable. Even my name, Michael, was the most common name from 1961 to 1988. Outside of my computer skills, there wasn't much that stood out about me. Dating? I had a few experiences, but serious relationships. Not really. By senior year, I was used to spending time alone. That all changed when I met Jennifer Riley. Jennifer was almost as average as I was, but I realized that average looked a lot better on a woman. She was a bit of a wallflower, and I watched her for quite some time before I built up the nerve to approach her. Our first conversation was brief and quiet, but we exchanged introductions. Over the next few weeks, we met for coffee and studied together at the library. It was nearly two months before we went on our first real date. From that point on, my life transformed. Fifteen years of happiness followed. Our courtship was short, and our engagement even shorter. We got married and moved into our first apartment in Chicago right after graduation. We commuted to our first jobs together, sharing both the morning and evening train rides. Financially, we were just scraping by, but we were doing it together. We had so much in common. Similar family backgrounds, dating histories, interests, and goals. Where we differed, we complemented each other perfectly. If I wasn't good at something, Jennifer was, and vice versa. I managed our finances better, while Jennifer excelled at organizing our social and family schedules. We worked as a team, and soon our lives began to flourish. Over the next few years, we both received several promotions. Our circle of friends grew significantly. We were able to save for our first home while still enjoying travel and entertainment. Our intimacy life began much like our relationship, slow and steady. From our first date, we held hands and kissed. Once we became exclusive, we progressed to more intimate affection. We remained virgins until the night of our engagement, after which our passion deepened alongside our growing success. Jennifer left her job after eight years when our son, Jacob, was born. Our daughter, Emily, arrived just over a year later. Yes, I know their names were among the most popular at the time. They were part of a family tradition. We bought a three-bedroom house in the suburbs, complete with space for a dog. We also got a family sedan and a minivan. In general, our lives came together nicely. Two kids, a pet a house, and two cars. Completely average. I didn't think I could be any happier, but I was wrong. My promotion to manager came shortly after Emily's first birthday. It felt like I was finally being recognized after years of blending in with the average crowd. My new salary was substantial, and we certainly didn't take it for granted. I had flexible hours, working from home most days and going into the office for staff and management meetings. People often say that money can't buy happiness, and I agree with that. But what it can buy are stylish clothes, personal grooming, better health care, a newer home in a nicer neighborhood, and a boost in confidence. I went from being average to slightly above average. My wife who I always thought looked beautiful at her average, became slightly above average, and I found her incredibly attractive. Our intimacy life, which I had always considered good, reached new heights. 
We traveled in more comfort and enjoyed more time with the kids, all while saving more and more for retirement. When Emily started elementary school, Jennifer decided she wanted to return to work part-time. She quickly landed a job at a startup marketing firm that she thought she'd enjoy. Her work hours lined up perfectly with the kids' school schedule, and she wrapped up her day just in time to pick them up. It was the perfect addition to our life. We didn't need her salary, so we saved all of it. According to my projections, by the time the kids finished college, we'd be able to retire and live a very comfortable life. I accidentally found out that my wife was cheating on me three months before our 15th wedding anniversary. It happened on my birthday. In fact, I came across the evidence two days before my birthday, although I didn't realize it at the time. It took me a few weeks to put it all together. At first, I didn't pay much attention to this when my wife began to pay more attention to her new job. This meant that she would work a few extra hours a week and I would have to pick up the kids from school. But it didn't affect my schedule, and I was happy to help. After about three months, I started to notice that she was getting distracted a lot. When I asked her about it, she explained that she was just trying to adjust to work and felt a little stressed. Wanting to lighten her workload, I took on more responsibilities around the house. Then our intimate life began to decline noticeably. We talked about it, and she said she was getting older and didn't need to do so much anymore. But it got better for a few weeks, and then it stopped. The weather got a little colder, and I was looking for one of my sweaters. I took over the laundry duties and accidentally got confused about which closet clothes should be stored in. Sorting through the sweaters on the shelf of her closet, I saw something hidden behind several old shoe boxes. It was hard not to notice her. A pink box with a white ribbon from a lingerie store was impossible not to recognize. The postcard addressed to the mistress caught my attention and delighted me. After a short internal debate, should I open it or wait? I decided to take a look. After reading the postcard, I wasn't sure I could wait for my birthday. The postcard read, Sorry for the packaging this came in. You can unwrap your real birthday present when I put on what's inside the box. Then we can try something new. I will always love you, Jennifer. I've always wanted to try this. Over the next 48 hours, I stepped up my game. I met her at the door with flowers, gave her a foot massage, and cooked her favorite dish. However, her reaction was not what I expected. She seemed to just tolerate my affection. On my birthday, I made sure the kids finished their homework early because I didn't want anything interfering with my gift. I was a bit surprised when Jennifer got home late from work, and even more puzzled when she asked what was for dinner. Still, I decided to go along with it, eager for my surprise. I suggested we go out for pizza, and the kids excitedly agreed. Michael teamed up with our waitress, and just before we left, the staff surprised me by singing Happy Birthday. I thought I saw a hint of surprise in my wife's eyes, but she quickly composed herself. I'll give you your present later, Michael, she said with a smile. The drive home was filled with tension. I nearly got into an accident. Waiting fifteen minutes for the kids to get ready for bed felt torturous, but the fifteen minutes afterward, waiting for them to fall asleep, was even worse. Luckily, Jennifer returned from a last-minute store trip for milk just after they were asleep. When I reached the bedroom, she wasn't there. I sat on the bed, and a moment later she walked out of the bathroom in a full-length flannel nightgown, without makeup, and her hair tied in a ponytail. I was starting to get frustrated with the situation. When was I going to get my gift? She slid into bed and pulled the covers over herself. As she reached to turn off the lamp, she paused. Oh, I almost forgot. She opened the drawer of her nightstand 
took out a small square box wrapped in the multicolored balloon paper we used for Michael's last birthday, and handed it to me. Happy birthday, honey. And that was it. She rolled over, turned off the light, and went to sleep. I was too shocked to even open her gift. The next day, my depression hit hard. I kept replaying the events, trying to figure out what had gone so wrong. I had no clue. I stewed in my sadness for nearly two weeks. That damn gift seemed to glow, taunting me as a reminder of my failure. I've heard all the clichés, how the husband is always the last to know, etc. But honestly, I was completely clueless. The idea of Jennifer cheating on me was so unimaginable that I never once considered it, but it was the first thought that crossed my mind when she called thirteen days after my birthday, saying she'd be home late. It's Alan's thirtieth birthday, and the staff is taking him out to celebrate. I might be really late. I don't remember how I responded or when I walked to the bedroom closet, but I do remember noticing the empty spot where my gift had been. I also remember the horrible pain in my chest and running to the bathroom to throw up. For longer than I'd like to admit, I thought I might be having a heart attack, and for a brief moment, I hoped that was the case, so that I'd soon be dead. Alan Henderson was Jennifer's boss a slick and sleazy advertising executive a few years younger than both Jennifer and me. I had only met him once and remembered not liking him much. He always seemed disingenuous when he spoke. It was Emily who brought me back to reality. Are you okay, Daddy? It took a moment for my eyes to focus on my daughter, who was hovering over me on the verge of tears. I'm fine, sweetheart. Daddy just ate something that didn't sit well. I'll be out in a minute. I just need to clean up. Eventually, I made it out of the bathroom, though I don't remember much after that. I do recall reaching for my dusty bottle of scotch. Based on the headache I had the next morning, I knew I had downed several glasses. I had no idea when Jennifer came home. The next morning, when I found her in the kitchen feeding the kids, she seemed completely normal, just going about her routine. However, the slight wince on her face when she sat down to eat crushed any remaining affection I had for her. It was subtle, but it was there. I wish I could say I confronted my unfaithful wife, but I didn't. I was devastated and could barely move. It didn't get better for weeks. I felt like a zombie. Each day, watching my wife go through the motions at home without a care made me feel worse. I thought I had hit rock bottom. It wasn't until the weekend of our fifteenth wedding anniversary that I finally decided to take action. I probably wouldn't have if I hadn't realized how much I was avoiding it. I knew I was being weak. If my dad were alive, he'd have called me out for it. Then my wife announced she had to travel for a work conference during our anniversary. I'm not sure why that upset me so much. It was just another sign of her disrespect. It hurt, especially since she seemed oblivious to the date. After drinking myself to sleep that night, I woke up filled with anger. I had reached my limit. I called my lawyer and made an appointment. I was ready to end this charade convinced my life couldn't get worse. I was wrong. I walked into my attorney's office with a ruthless mindset, but that quickly turned into a sense of crushing disbelief. I knew divorces could be tough, and I thought my wife's infidelity would work in my favor. Instead, my lawyer kept poking holes in my case. I had no proof of the affair, and even if I did, it wouldn't change much. My wife would still be entitled to half of our assets. I had no grounds to claim she was an unfit parent, so my best bet would be shared custody. The income gap favored her as well, meaning I would owe spousal support and child support. She was likely to get primary custody and stay in the house for the sake of the children. I felt like a fool while she played the role of the deceitful partner. 
I went from feeling depressed to utterly distraught. After a few weeks, she even asked me about it. You really don't look well, Michael. Is something bothering you? No, dear. At least she feigned concern. As for me, I just drifted through life. Then I got fired, which I didn't realize at the time, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. The evening news sparked a flicker of hope in me. I had been watching one grim story after another, which mirrored my own mood perfectly. Then, out of the blue, I saw it. A major employer on the East Coast had declared bankruptcy. Former employees were racing to secure their final paychecks and were anxious about their pensions. For a moment, I felt relief, realizing that some people might be worse off than I was. But then the news anchor returned with his analysis. The employees would likely win a judgment against their former employer, but it wouldn't change anything. There was nothing left. All the money was gone. It didn't take much for me to piece together a basic plan. My wife couldn't claim what didn't exist. We would have nothing, so we would split nothing. Sure, I was undermining myself, but I was already going to lose half anyway. Did I really care about the rest? My plan began simply. I was unemployed and had no intention of looking for work. I would deplete our life savings until there was nothing left. I know it was a foolish idea. Even I didn't believe it would work. But it was something I could hold on to. Two years is quite a stretch. It felt painfully dull when I was on my own, which was most of the time. I realized that Jennifer had truly been the heart of our friend group. As she pulled away, I found myself lacking any genuine friendships. Being an only child, and having lost both my parents at a young age, my dad to a heart attack and my mom to cancer, left me feeling utterly alone. I know detailing every moment of my life would bore you, so I'll just say it was dreadful. For two years, my children were the only bright spot in my life. I had never spent money on anything unnecessary before. I still kept receipts for all my purchases. I began making small weekly cash withdrawals and saving the money. After about two months, I realized we weren't spending money quickly enough to make a difference. Clearly, I was good at saving, but not so great at spending. So I decided to step up my game and tweak my initial plan. I enrolled in a local executive MBA program, which cost nearly $120,000. I also bought a new luxury SUV for $60,000 in cash. I fully funded educational savings accounts for the kids, totaling another $260,000. I spent thousands on a new wardrobe and began making larger cash withdrawals twice a week. After dropping the kids off at school, I'd go to the bank and then head to the lakeshore. I didn't really gamble with the cash I took. I spent a little here and there just to keep up appearances. I made sure to have enough expenses to show I had been at the casino, including receipts for lunch, snacks, and parking. Most of the money, however, went into a wall safe in our garage, creating my personal post-divorce fund in case things got messy. My other significant expense? Full-time private surveillance on my wife and her lover, which I regret to say was quite costly. You might wonder if my wife noticed my spending habits. I think she did, except for the gambling. I had to inform her about transferring money for the kids since I needed her signature on the custodial accounts. She saw my new car and clothes, but never commented on them. I imagine she thought I was just busy with work and that life was still good for us. She made some purchases too, but I never mentioned anything. I often found myself curious about who benefited from her more frequent lingerie purchases, but it was never a topic we discussed. We maintained a cordial relationship and interacted daily, almost like two roommates who didn't quite get along. As for intimacy, that was off the table. Spending time with my children was the highlight of my life. 
I supported their interests, helped with homework, played games, and took them to parks and movies. Since I took on the role of the family chef, they seemed eager to assist me. I found simple recipes and encouraged their involvement. Jennifer would usually join us at some point during the week. While I didn't make an effort to include her, I didn't exclude her either. If she wanted to participate, she did so without any prompting from me. I received a weekly report on what my wife was doing. I thought she was just having fun with her boss. But it was actually a few guys from her office. A few months later, the company's customers began to come to her disco. Did it hurt? Not quite. Even then I thought she was a girl of easy virtue. The fact that I now had proof didn't move me at all. It wasn't very interesting to read. The video was like a poorly directed adult film. In a way it made me feel better, but not much. It was clear that Alan Henderson was not a very skilled lover, although he had the opportunity to share his talents with several different women. This surprised me a little. Based on her gift, I assumed that he and my cheating wife had some kind of relationship, but in fact they were just engaged in intimacy. She just let him do it. It was the same with most of the other six men who had fun with my wife. However, there was one client, a short guy with a nerdy appearance who sported glasses and a protective patch on his pocket to strengthen his geek status, which Jennifer really liked. The photos and videos were too grainy to tell if she liked it, but in my opinion, it looked pretty painful. After about a year, it dawned on me that I hadn't had intimacy since my journey began. It didn't really bother me. It was just another addition to my shitty existence. After a year, I stopped monitoring. I saw enough. And in fact, it was much more difficult to sort out the garbage that was sent to me. Despite my classes, kids, and gambling, I found myself with a lot of free time. So I decided to focus on my life post-marriage, which I expected would happen eventually. I started a new workout routine. I had always been in decent shape. Not anything remarkable, of course. But during this time, I made noticeable improvements in my bench press and running endurance. I believe that big muscles and good looks are mostly determined by genetics, and I clearly didn't fall into either category. Still, I was genuinely pleased with how I looked. I began researching the latest developments in my former industry, realizing I would need a job eventually. A year away from the chaos had put me further behind than I anticipated. I dedicated a few hours each day to learning about new technologies and software. I particularly focused on my old company, CTS. It seemed to be stagnant. While they weren't losing market share and revenues remained stable, they weren't making any progress. In the tech world, if you're not advancing, you're falling behind. I also spent a significant amount of time looking into divorce. While I did entertain some thoughts about devising schemes to get back at my soon-to-be ex-wife, most of my focus was on understanding how divorce impacts children. I had already processed much of my pain, and the kids played a big role in that. I wanted to ensure I was fully prepared for their transition when the time came. There's a wealth of information available, though much of it struck me as nonsense. Eight months into my journey, I began to feel a sense of panic. My wife started returning home at a regular hour and began engaging with me asking about my day. I responded tersely, but she didn't seem put off. She began dressing more provocatively for bed, as if trying to revive the intimacy we once had. After a few weeks, things took a turn for the worse. For a year and a half, she had been emotionally detached, just going through the motions, and now she was complaining about our lack of communication. She talked about wanting to work on our marriage, so I decided to stop talking to her altogether. I fell silent. Her efforts to reconcile continued until her birthday. I left her gift on the dining room table, wrapped in paper she would recognize, 
as I had recycled it from the last present she gave me. The gift itself wouldn't be a surprise either. It had taken me six months to open the last birthday gift from her, which was a watch with a cheap digital face. I had been quite upset when I saw my birthday present in the impulse buy section of our local convenience store, a $9.95 watch from the Quick Mart. I felt angry, but when I noticed a matching ladies' model, I decided to let it go, bought it, and waited 18 months to give it to her. I wish I could have witnessed her reaction, but unfortunately, I wasn't there when she opened it. The kids and I had an emergency movie night and returned home late. She was already gone by the time we got up the next morning. Everything quickly reverted to my new normal. Jennifer started staying later and later at the office, and we barely spoke at home. Then it finally happened. Michael, I want a divorce. I had hoped she would wrap things up quickly, but it took nearly a week before I received her petition. The whole situation was almost absurd. She was asking for spousal and child support, a biased distribution of assets in her favor, and cited mental and emotional cruelty as key reasons. I decided to wait until the following Monday to take the kids camping. I didn't want them around when I confronted her. We returned six days later, feeling relaxed and rejuvenated. When we got home, Jennifer was waiting for us, sitting alone in the living room. She looked unwell, possibly suffering from the stomach flu. I couldn't help but wonder what had shocked her the most. I had filed a counterpetition for divorce on the grounds of adultery, seeking the house, our only significant asset, and full custody of the children. I also requested spousal and child support since I had been unemployed and caring for the kids for the past two years. I initiated alienation of affection lawsuits against the seven men Jennifer had been involved with. I didn't expect to win, but Illinois law allowed it, and I was ready to fight back. Additionally, I filed civil lawsuits against her employer and the businesses of three clients who had taken advantage of her. Again, winning seemed unlikely, but the negative publicity could play in my favor. Finally, I sent a DVD of Jennifer's escapades to her parents and her best friend, making it clear that I wasn't afraid to use the evidence I had against her. I wanted her to fully understand what I had outlined in my countersuit, and I wasn't taking any chances. The kids grabbed a snack and headed to their rooms to prepare for bed, hardly acknowledging their mother, who didn't try to engage with them. I went to the fridge for a beer, then made my way to the living room and sank into the chair across from Jennifer. For a while she didn't look at me, so I enjoyed my beer. Besides appearing sick, she seemed to be crying about something. Maybe she was hurt? Eventually she spoke, but her voice was barely a whisper. You'll ruin me. I waited for her to meet my gaze so I could see her eyes when I replied. It took a moment. God, I hope so. I expected the moment to feel more significant. When a single tear rolled down her cheek, I felt nothing. Do you hate me that much? Oh no, Jennifer, I don't hate you. Hate takes effort, and I honestly invest none in you. All my effort goes into taking care of myself and my kids. But I'm your whiff. Stop! I won't let a piece of trash like you tarnish my wife's good name. My wife was a loving, caring woman, my best friend and partner, and the mother of my children. She's gone. You're just the imposter in her body. Don't act like you have any connection to me. It took her a long time to respond again. What am I going to do now? Is that a rhetorical question, or do you really want my answer? I didn't wait for her to reply before I continued. I suppose there are several ways you could handle your situation. One of the options is to move away and try to build a new life, which is what I would choose. I will never allow my children to spend any meaningful time with you, so this should not affect your decision to leave. Alternatively, 
You could try to stay here, keep a low profile and loiter around the city. But who knows what people might hear about your past, or who would want to hire someone like you. You might end up meeting some loser who doesn't care about your reputation, but what kind of scumbag would that be? Or you can do something terrible to yourself, although I really hope you don't go down that path. It would have robbed me of the chance to see you suffer as the person you are. But then again, I doubt my opinion matters to someone like you, especially after you decided to sleep with your boss. I've been dreaming about giving this speech for months. I should have been satisfied to be able to say it. However, as I watched each word diminish what was left of her spirit, I felt empty instead. Life after my divorce was a mixed experience. I performed far better with my lawsuits than I ever anticipated, netting just over a million dollars in settlements from the three companies whose employees had affairs with my wife. This was unexpected, as my attorney had warned me not to expect much. During our review of the situation, we realized that, having witnessed how my ex-wife's company was handled, they wanted to avoid any negative publicity. We effectively undermined my ex-wife's company through discovery motions, depositions, and leaks to the media. I also launched a discreet campaign, emailing the CEOs of their remaining clients with information about my wife, her boss, and their affairs. Do you really want to be associated with this company when everything goes wrong? It took time, but gradually their revenues dwindled. Employees wanting to distance themselves from the scandal began to leave. Ultimately, the company filed for bankruptcy. Alan Henderson was dismissed and left town in disgrace. The $200,000 settlement I received was smaller than my other wins, but it felt much more gratifying. I didn't gain anything from my alienation of affection lawsuits, which I never really expected to. However, Four wives did manage to extract significant settlements in their subsequent divorces. It wasn't all smooth sailing. I suffered personally during this time. I frequently encountered people who were aware of my situation, and the teasing was relentless for a while. Whether it was a blessing or a curse, I found that I didn't care much. I already felt like a failure, so hearing it echoed by others didn't impact me. Some of the insults were surprisingly clever. I managed to protect my children from most of the fallout, which was my main concern. They were sad for a while, but recovered quickly. My greatest triumph was returning to CTS as Vice President of Design and Development. One of my distractions from my personal struggles was getting back into programming. During my two difficult years, I developed an add-on for the main CTS software that allowed easy integration with two competing software packages. I started my own company to sell my design, and within a year, all three companies approached me with offers to buy my business and software. I ended up selling for $11 million and received an impressive compensation package from CTS. For a time, I considered retirement, but with my lack of a social life, I realized I would likely become a recluse if I didn't find a reason to leave the house every day. My new income allowed me to hire a lovely elderly woman who worked as both a part-time housekeeper and nanny for my kids. After a year, Mrs. Marlene Jensen moved in with us full-time, residing in the in-law suite above the garage of our new home. She became like a grandmother to my children, mostly gentle and kind, but firm when necessary. What I valued most was the wisdom she shared with the kids, the kind that only comes from experience. I loved my children and tried my best to be a supportive and caring father. However, I was also damaged, jaded, and tough. I often sought her advice. She served as my sounding board during decision-making. The kids grew into well-adjusted adults, and I saw them and their families occasionally. Unfortunately, as time passed, our closeness diminished. I held no resentment against them. 
it was better for me to keep my distance so my bitterness wouldn't affect their lives. Mrs. Jensen worked for us until the kids went off to college, after which she retired. I offered her free room and board as a pension since she had been a constant presence in my life for fifteen years. She did her best to encourage me to live again and find someone to share my life with. I appreciated her efforts, but in the end, she passed away knowing I would always be alone. I never really opened up to anyone again. My friendships were shallow and unfulfilling, and I rarely dated, only attending a few group dinners arranged by casual acquaintances. I earned a deserved reputation as a cold-hearted, ruthless person who shouldn't be crossed. For the most part, people avoided me, and I had no one to blame but myself. My intimate contacts were sufficiently organized. My growing wealth allowed me to maintain a permanent staff of call girls. I paid them well for their time. For a while, I particularly liked one woman named Candy although I later found out that her real name was Mary Beth. She was an unforgettable partner, and I felt that there was more to us than just a relationship with clients. However, I didn't want to burden anyone with my problems, so when I felt that she was too attached to me, I broke up with her. As for Jennifer, she had a hard life. She's been trying to contact me for almost a year, I'm not sure what her intentions were. Maybe she thought we could make peace, or she wanted to take care of my children. I warned her, but she didn't listen to my words. She was trying to stay in Chicago, so I followed her. Whenever she applied for a job, I made sure that her work history was mentioned in it. When she started dating, apparently right away, I sent out packages to her new partners with information about the woman they had let into their lives. I didn't mind if they decided to keep her after they found out the truth, but I didn't want her to rewrite history as if it never happened. I had to deal with it every day, so it seemed fair that she did it too. As I mentioned, my ex-wife relentlessly bombarded me with unanswered calls, letters I ignored, and a constantly full email inbox. A part of me might have wanted to see her suffer a little. I realize now that seeking professional help early on could have preserved some part of my soul and helped me regain a sense of normalcy. But ultimately, I never went, and as time went on, it felt like it was too late to make a difference. I could have changed my phone number, but I didn't. An assistant could have managed my mail, yet I always handled it myself. I could have blocked her emails, which would have stopped me from accidentally opening one. Her messages were filled with apologies that felt hollow. Of course, it was a situation that spiraled out of control. She always claimed to love me. Hadn't she suffered enough? In response, I sent her a gift along with a simple note. I chose the most risque lingerie I could find from her favorite store wrapped it carefully in a pure white ribbon that highlighted the pink box. I added a beautifully handwritten note, and I'm sure she noticed the irony when she opened the card addressed to Bit H. I hoped she grasped my intention when she discovered the large butt plug and bottle of lube among her new outfit. I thought, Go Fuk Yourself was a pretty clear message. One of her potential suitors confronted me about tormenting my ex-wife. He showed up at my door, fueled by liquid courage, and pushed me back as I opened it. That was a mistake on his part. As I've mentioned, I'm not anything special, no martial arts background or special forces training. I was just an average guy who had never been violent and had never even been in a fight. But I had a deep well of rage and pure hatred for my wife and her lovers and he became the unfortunate target of that anger. I ended up with a black eye and a cracked rib. He was lucky to walk away alive. He pleaded guilty to misdemeanor assault and unlawful entry, receiving probation as a first-time offender. I think the extensive reconstructive surgery and rehabilitation 
left a bigger mark on him. Jennifer never tried to reach out again. After a year, I stopped having her followed when I learned she had found stable work cleaning rooms at a roadside hotel about 700 miles away in rural Virginia. The only other time I saw her was 16 years later at my daughter's wedding. I know my children reconnected with Jennifer a few years after they graduated from college, and I didn't try to stop them from finding her. Time had not been kind to her. She had gained at least 20 pounds, and deep wrinkles lined her lips, clear signs of her smoking. It was a noticeable change. Overall, she looked aged and worn out. Yet, beneath it all, I still recognized the woman to whom I had once given my heart. I felt nothing for her, but I saw her. She sat alone in the back of the church, in the bride's section. Her interaction with my daughter was brief, polite, but distant. She never attempted to speak with me, and we kept at least thirty feet apart until the end of the night. Outside she was waiting for a cab. When I noticed the small gold band with a tiny diamond on her left hand, I smiled for the first time in a long while. Perhaps she had found someone better than me. I approached her, my gaze fixed on the ring. When I looked up to meet her eyes, I saw a deep sadness reflected in her gaze. For the record, you ruined my life first. I glanced at her left hand, then back into her eyes. I'm glad you found someone. I hope he makes you happy. I quickly walked to my car where my driver had been waiting attentively. Good evening, Mr. Smith. I trust your evening went well. Shall we head to the club? It went as well as I could have hoped, Jonathan. Let's go straight back home. I'd prefer to be alone tonight. Of course, sir. As we drove away, I tried my best not to look back. But I did catch a glimpse of her brief wave. Goodbye. Michael Smith wasn't your typical handsome guy. At first glance, there was nothing particularly striking about him. However, he was genuinely sweet, attractive, and intelligent. He stood out from the other guys. We first met on what was probably the worst night of my college experience. My sorority sisters had abandoned me during a fraternity mixer to hook up with a couple of obnoxious frat boys. They had promised to stick together, but as soon as the chance arose, they ditched me for the popular crowd. I spent two hours waiting for them, dealing with drunken jerks who kept hitting on me, when Michael finally approached. He looked straight into my eyes and politely introduced himself, engaging in small talk for a few moments, almost in a whisper. But he maintained eye contact the whole time. After a little while, he said goodbye. I really enjoyed our conversation, Jennifer. I'd love to take you for coffee sometime. Here's my name and number if you're interested. Thank you for chatting with me. It's been the highlight of my semester. I'll admit, I nearly didn't call him. I waited just over a week before I thought, why not? We met for coffee, and he asked me all sorts of questions. I found him really easy to talk to. During our first conversation, I realized what made him stand out. He had a calm and unassuming presence. He wasn't bad-looking, maybe even a bit handsome, but it was his intelligence that shone through. He could engage in discussions on any topic and was well-informed about everything I brought up. He mentioned he was a computer science major, but it was evident he could excel in various fields. We started discussing my classes, especially the ones I struggled with, particularly ancient philosophy. I was majoring in business with a minor in advertising, and I had delayed taking several of my least favorite electives, which made things harder than I anticipated. Michael's gaze never shifted. Just like during our initial meeting, he maintained eye contact throughout our conversation. His intentions were clear. He was genuinely interested in me as a person, which flattered me. He proposed that we study together at the student union or the library. So three days later, we met again. I wouldn't call it studying. It felt more like advanced tutoring. Michael dedicated three hours on a Friday night at the library to help me prepare for my philosophy exam. When I struggled with something, he would apologize for his teaching style and try a different approach. 
His patience was remarkable, and he never made me feel foolish for not understanding. When I called him the following Tuesday to share the news that I passed my exam, I could feel his excitement over the phone. He seemed genuinely proud of me. He downplayed his help, saying he was being selfish, wanting to spend time with me, and that it was the most enjoyable time he had spent on campus. I also discovered other ways in which Michael was different from most guys. During the week, he was completely focused on his studies. No parties, no drinking, and no distractions. At first, I found this a bit frustrating, but it eventually grew on me. Over the next few weeks, while we never went on what I would consider a proper date, he called me every day just to check in and see how I was doing. He left me notes to let me know he was thinking of me. We continued to meet for coffee or at the library and occasionally shared a quick lunch. When we were together, he kept asking about me, my family, my interests, and my dreams. He was open and honest whenever I posed questions to him. One time, I asked if he was afraid of anything, my go-to question on dates. I'd read in a magazine that it could reveal how much someone trusts you. I expected the typical frat boy responses, which usually ranged from nothing to that I won't have partied enough before leaving college. But Michael sat in silence for a moment, gazing into space. Then he looked me directly in the eyes and said, I'm afraid I won't be a good father. I grew up as an only child. My parents both died while I was in high school, and we were never close. I lived with my uncle until I graduated. He was quite the womanizer, and we had little in common. I think he was relieved when I went off to college. I want to get married and have children, but I lack experience in a loving, supportive family environment. I want to be a good father, but I worry I won't know how. When he finished, I sensed he was hoping for some kind of reaction. Too much? He asked. No, Michael, not too much. Just enough. About four weeks into our relationship, Michael asked if I was free on Saturday. I said I was, and he mentioned he would come by the sorority around lunchtime. In the days leading up to Saturday, I felt uneasy. I kept asking him what he had planned, but he wouldn't share. My sorority sisters kept smiling and whispering, which only added to my nerves. When he finally arrived, he was dressed in maroon and sky blue, accompanied by three fraternity brothers, who were also in similar outfits, carrying a large cooler and two big warming trays filled with food. Michael held a DVD in one hand and a West Ham jersey for me in the other, beaming with joy. He asked me to show him the great room of the house. As we turned the corner, I was stunned to see that most of the room was decorated in West Ham colors, and a chant erupted. I was in complete shock. For about 30 seconds, I had been lamenting the fact that I missed my family's trip to England. A distant cousin of mine had made the roster for the club team West Ham United, and my family was planning to go to London to see him play. Unfortunately, the trip coincided with a crucial testing week for me, so I couldn't attend. I shared my disappointment with Michael. To cheer me up, he had a friend at the local sports bar record a West Ham game from their satellite feed. He researched the team's chants, taught them to his friends and my sorority sisters, and planned when to start singing during the game. He and his friends brought over a few cases of English ale and made fish and chips. As we watched the game, we sang, cheered, and celebrated together. In the 72nd minute, he asked everyone to quiet down and told me to focus on the screen. I got to see my cousin score his first Premier League goal, albeit on a tape delay. No one else in my family could say that. It was one of the kindest things anyone had ever done for me. After the game, he and his friends cleaned up and headed out, and Michael said he would call me later. I was left to fend off teasing about the dreamy look in my eyes, but it was worth it. Our calls, notes, and coffee meetups continued for a few weeks. One day, while I was enjoying a latte, I noticed he seemed unusually nervous. Is everything okay, Michael? What? Oh yes, of course. I was just wondering if you had any plans for Friday night and if you might be interested in going to dinner with me. Like a date. I would love to go to dinner with you, Michael. The relief on his face was unexpected, quickly replaced by one of the broadest smiles I'd ever seen. It stayed there as he finished his coffee while we walked out the door 
and when he turned to give me a final wave before heading to class. I could spot it from nearly a block away. From that moment on, everything turned into a perfect whirlwind of love, romance, and friendship. I performed better in school than ever before and was having more fun than I'd ever experienced. People treated me differently, too. I felt more comfortable being myself, the woman Michael adored, and I think that attracted others to me. Being around Michael was like receiving a daily boost to my ego. Although he often underestimated himself, he never hesitated to speak about me in glowing terms. In reality, he was a decent-looking guy, fit and even a bit athletic. Always well-groomed and somewhat stylish, he was personable and well-liked, though a bit shy around new people. Without a doubt, he was the smartest person in any room, professors included, and everyone recognized it. Yet, with his laid-back demeanor, he shunned the spotlight to spend time with me, often saying he was just an average guy who struck gold when he met me. I would call myself cute, and my friends and family would agree. I had always felt a bit self-conscious about my appearance and body, especially since some of my sorority sisters were stunning, with model-like features and perfect bikini bodies. However, looking at myself through Michael's eyes made me feel special. The longer I was with him, the more cherished I felt. I was absolutely thrilled when graduation finally arrived. One of the quirky end-of-year traditions at the sorority was the husband potential game. As one of the few sisters without a long-term boyfriend, I had never been able to take part. This event was a favorite among the alumni and always drew a big crowd. The concept was simple. Each sister would stand before the assembled alumni and share either a positive or negative anecdote about another sister's boyfriend from the past year. The sister whose boyfriend received the most positive feedback was crowned the winner. While I can't say I was completely surprised by the outcome, I was still a bit taken aback. For the first time in the event's 29-year history, my Michael had garnered all positive responses. Every single sister had something good to say about him. I felt an immense sense of pride, yet I was slightly disappointed that due to tradition, I wouldn't be able to inform him of his victory. Three days later, I found a way to reward him properly. The day after graduation, Michael drove me home. I was from Chicago, and he had received a job offer there. During the four-hour drive, we held hands and chatted stopping briefly for breakfast and a quick makeout session. We arrived at my childhood home just before noon, and Michael spent the next two hours charming my parents. I was taken aback when he asked if he could buy my dad a beer. They disappeared before I could object, leaving my mom smiling through her teary eyes. Oh, Jennifer, that one is a keeper. Believe me, Mom, I know when Michael and Dad finally returned two hours later, they were both smiling and laughing. Michael told me he would come back to pick me up for dinner after checking into his hotel. He said a quick goodbye to my parents and then left. Later, he revealed that he had asked my father for permission to marry me. That evening was unforgettable, truly magical. After a wonderful romantic Italian dinner, Michael proposed to me on the outdoor veranda of the Willis Tower. The evening was clear and the lights of Chicago on the horizon almost matched the warmth in my heart. By that time, I had never had intimacy before, but that evening it felt like a precious gift. It was part of the perfect setting. He was patient, loving, and gentle, creating a magnificent wave of love and desire that knocked me off my feet. When I asked him how he managed to become such an amazing lover, he replied modestly, I'm reading. A lot. Our lives were almost perfect. Michael landed a good job right after graduation and kept getting promotions, making me happier than ever. I don't mean to downplay those years. They were incredibly important to me. It's hard to articulate just how joyful I felt during the first decade of our life together, and I can't fully express how having children completed my life. I'm not detailing those years because they don't relate to my downfall, and sharing them would only cloud your understanding of what led to it. I recognize my mistake. Actually, my mistakes. I know why I stumbled. I didn't trust Michael enough. What I loved most about Michael was that he never concealed his vulnerability from me. He shared everything, including his insecurities, and he never held back. 
for a long time, I had nothing to hide. My life was a fairy tale, and my family was wonderful. Michael treated me as a true partner, involving me in every decision that impacted our lives. It didn't matter that he earned five times my salary or managed our finances better. He always sought my advice and consent. Most of the time, this made me feel special, but occasionally, it left me feeling inadequate, as though I wasn't pulling my weight. I never communicated this to Michael. If I had, I wouldn't have destroyed my life. I know he would have helped me. He loved me deeply. He would have helped me feel complete. That small insecurity grew over the years, perhaps even festered. By the time the kids started school, I felt lost in my own skin. I craved something different to give me a sense of independent purpose. I wasn't seeking a lover, not at all. I loved my husband and was more than satisfied in our intimate life. Our intimacy life was passionate, albeit a bit conventional, mostly my doing. I knew my husband wanted to be more experimental perhaps, but I figured why disrupt a good thing? What I truly wanted was to feel like an equal, not just be treated like one. So I found a job and announced my decision to take it. I was fully prepared to justify my reasons for wanting to work. Our argument lasted all of four seconds. I think that sounds great, Jennifer. Whatever makes you happy. And just like that, I thought I had solved my problem on my own. The sheer vanity of my initial thinking would later make me cringe, but at the time, it felt exhilarating. I felt like I could conquer the world as an independent, confident woman. The atmosphere in our office could best be described as conducive to flirting, and at worst, it resembled a bad place. My colleagues, both men and women, were young, brave, and full of life. There were numerous affairs between employees, and from the outside, it seemed that they drew inspiration. There was no real relationship, just casual meetings for pleasure. Everyone seemed to be openly talking about it without any sense of guilt. My boss, Alan Henderson, was probably the most famous of them. He was quite good-looking, although not my type. People often made fun of him because he couldn't keep the girl, congratulating him on his latest achievements. I wasn't the type to jump into bed with the first guy I saw. In fact, I flatly refused one of them. And yet, it made me wonder if Michael and I were missing something in our intimate life. Our group of friends were rather reticent about intimacy, and I realized that we never had conversations, even close to the daily discussions taking place in the office. After our first corporate Christmas party, at which I introduced Alan to Michael, my life changed dramatically. I immediately felt the dislike between them, despite their feigned friendliness. Since then, I avoided discussing my work with Michael and never mentioned Alan, as I could see that my job and the boss bothered him. After that evening, the atmosphere in the office also changed. Alan began to pay increased attention to me, publicly praised my work, and found out about my well-being. He started inviting me to lunch, where we discussed our projects in detail. Gradually, he became more interested in my opinion and asked personal questions, and before I knew it, our conversations became more intimate. He also started praising my appearance. Looking back, I realized that he had been working on me for months, and I stupidly absorbed it all. I can't exactly name the events that led to me being next to Alan on his desk after everyone else had left for the day. With deep regret, I admit that I enjoyed every moment. Alan's skillful seduction made me feel wanted, a feeling that I thought was long gone. Years later, reflecting on my actions, I fully realized the extent of my betrayal. I felt like Michael didn't want me because I didn't give him a reason to want me. I realized what kind of person he was. He would never do anything to embarrass me. I was a real partner and lover for him, not just a casual hobby. However, he was incredibly perceptive. Even the slightest hint from me would have changed the situation. Any suggestion that I wanted something more would have serious consequences. A painful analysis of my marriage showed that Michael was secretly looking for ways to improve our lives, but I ignored him. I am very ashamed to admit that I did all this and much more for Alan. I was completely devoted to him, and I loved it. I got too involved with Alan before I realized the reality. I gave him a lot of things as a birthday present, 
and he treated me the way I deserved. He used me as a girl of easy virtue. It was painful, and the stark contrast with Michael almost immediately changed my point of view. I realized that Alan didn't love me, and I made a serious mistake. The very next day, I told Alan that our affair was over. He laughed and fired me from his office. When I returned from lunch, the package was on my desk, accompanied by a note instructing me to be at Alan's office at 5.30. The contents of the package guaranteed my cooperation, the photos in which Alan was with me. Sleeping with two of my colleagues who were waiting for me in Alan's office was almost bearable compared to what I had to endure over the past 18 months. I became an object of the company. My supervisor was Alan, and my hatred for him was comparable only to the disgust I felt for myself. I've been desperately looking for a way out, but I've always failed. The decision came by itself only when I reached the limit of realizing the depravity of what I was being forced to do. When they demanded that I sleep with a guy with a provocative appearance in a conference room full of people, I realized that I was finished. That was the last straw. I finally found my answer, the one that had escaped me for so long. Courage. I told Alan I was done and didn't care who he showed the pictures to. He just laughed, and that was the end of it. I felt so foolish. When I woke up from my nightmare, I was shocked by the state of our home. Michael and the kids seemed perfectly fine without me. Deep down, I had assumed they might be struggling with the neglect I had imposed on them, but it turned out to be the opposite. It was as if I wasn't needed at all. Michael was still thriving. He had a new car, new clothes, and looked every bit the successful executive. Guilt overwhelmed me as I realized just how long I had been ignoring my family. Right then, I made up my mind to recommit myself to them and do whatever I could to make up for my betrayal. But there was a distance between us that hadn't been there before. I often wondered how long it had been there. Michael never raised his voice at me. We never argued, but he treated me like an unwelcome guest. I decided to try my hardest to win him back. I tried to seduce him, intimacy lingerie, subtle hints, but nothing worked. He barely touched me. After several months, I took a hard look at our marriage. There was no intimacy life, no intimacy, and no communication. I realized I couldn't continue living like that. I suggested we try marriage counseling. After that, Michael completely stopped talking to me, not just confiding less. He literally didn't say a word to me for weeks. By the time my birthday came around, I was at my breaking point, but I allowed myself a glimmer of excitement. I thought, surely he couldn't ignore me on my birthday. I was so wrong. When I came home from work, expecting to see what my family had planned, the house was empty. The only thing out of place was a small wrapped box on the dining room table. I knew what it was before I even opened it. A few years earlier, I had forgotten Michael's birthday and, in a panic, bought him a cheap watch from a nearby store. I meant to make up for it later, but I never did. Eventually, I forgot all about it. My gift back then was a mistake. His gift now was intentional. I was livid by the time I went to bed. Keeping the kids away from me on my birthday felt like pure cruelty. I couldn't believe he would do something so hurtful. And the gift, that crossed the line. I should have seen the signs that something was seriously wrong. The symbolism alone should have clued me in. Michael wasn't a bad person. He was the kindest, most loving man I had ever known. If I hadn't been so consumed with anger over that stupid gift, maybe I could have saved our marriage. If I had confessed my own mistakes and begged for forgiveness, there might have been a chance. But instead, in that moment, I stopped thinking about fixing our marriage and started thinking about divorce. I was sad, but resolute. It took me a few weeks to finalize everything with a lawyer. I explained how Michael had become distant, even cruel, how he kept the children away from me, how he ignored my requests for counseling, how he had completely stopped speaking to me. My lawyer immediately reacted to my comments. She assured me I'd receive a favorable settlement. We went over the documents, and I felt that I was being fair while standing up for what I needed for a reasonable life. The only thing left was delivering the difficult news. I stood silently at the doorway of the den, watching the man who had once been my husband, my soulmate. 
He looked the same, but he wasn't. I had finally reached my limit. Michael, I want a divorce. There was a long pause, but I couldn't read any emotion on his face. I thought I saw a faint smile, but it was probably just shock. His response wasn't what I expected. No yelling, no questions. Okay. And that was it. He was served with the divorce papers the following Friday. Michael seemed in a better mood that weekend. But even if he was trying to make amends for his recent behavior, it was too late. I had no desire to reconcile. He even said goodbye to me at the door when I left for work on Monday morning. Too little. Too late, I thought. When I arrived at the office, I knew something was wrong, but I had no idea what. My boss, the company president, and our corporate lawyer were having a heated argument in the conference room, waving papers around. I was so focused on their outburst that I didn't notice the man standing by my desk. His voice startled me. Jennifer Smith? Yes. You've been served. He handed me a large envelope, snapped a picture, and left. I hadn't even had a chance to sit down or look at the envelope's contents when a security guard and the HR manager appeared in front of me. Mrs. Smith, you're being suspended pending an investigation into allegations of inappropriate workplace conduct. Please gather your belongings and leave the building, she said. Packing my things while my co-workers watched was humiliating. It got worse when I was escorted out. I had no idea what was happening. I had just pulled out of the parking lot when my phone rang. It was my lawyer, and before I could even say hello, she launched into a tirade. The only phrases I could make out were withholding crucial information and making her look like a fool. I drove home in silence. Once again, the house was empty when I arrived. It wasn't until I had calmed down enough to remember the envelope that I realized the extent of the disaster I had set in motion. Michael's counterpetition was crushing. Nearly all of my extramarital affairs had been documented. Our savings were gone. He had drained almost all of it. But the word that hurt the most, adultery. I thought things couldn't get any worse. Desperate for support, I called my parents. My father called me a, a girl of easy virtue and hung up. He didn't need to explain why, I already knew. What felt like the loneliest week of my life at the time, I would later look back on as the good days. I eventually found a note from Michael, saying he had taken the kids camping and would return on Sunday. That first evening, around seven o'clock, my oldest friend Rebecca called to check on me. She mentioned that Michael had sent her a DVD and warned me that I didn't want to know what was on it. Over the following days, my lawyer laid out the grim reality. I had been fired for cause, my company, several clients, and all of my intimacy partners were facing lawsuits. I was going to lose custody of my children and ultimately everything. At that point, I was desperate to do anything to make Michael drop all the lawsuits. I tried to prepare for his return, but I couldn't stop crying. I was a wreck when my family came back home. The kids walked past me as if I didn't even exist. Michael came in a few minutes later, beer in hand, looking completely unbothered. I could barely find the words to speak. You're going to ruin me. The raw hatred in his voice shattered me. God, I hope so. When I tried to remind him of our history as husband and wife, he called me a, a girl of easy virtue. By then, I wasn't even talking to him directly. I was just thinking out loud. But Michael exploded into a rage that lasted several minutes. A girl of easy virtue. Tra, H, bit, H. Every word cut deeper. I was done. Then he got up and left the room. I can honestly say I didn't just give up. I tried to reach out to Michael, but he refused to talk to me. I wondered how he and the kids were getting by without money, but everything seemed fine. Sometimes I would secretly watch him dropping them off or picking them up from school. I couldn't find a job and had to rely on unemployment. My parents refused to talk to me. I needed somewhere to stay, so I moved from one friend's place to another, mostly divorced men. No one wanted to keep me around for long. One day things would be fine, and the next they wanted me out. I started seeing a therapist on my lawyer's advice. 
she thought that showing remorse and seeking professional help on my own might help in court. I had little hope. I worked through some issues, most of which I've already shared with you. But the best advice my therapist gave me came near the end of our sessions. To run, far away. I'm not sure why he decided to respond to me. Maybe it was a phone call, an email, or one of the many letters I'd sent. But whatever the reason, I came home to find a package from Michael waiting for me. I recognized the store's gift box immediately. The card was addressed to me in a crude manner. When I saw the huge intimacy toy and bottle of lube inside, I knew. He knew almost everything. He truly despised me and had a very specific suggestion for how I should spend my time. I'm not sure why realizing that he knew about my willing betrayal made everything so much worse. But it did. I cried, hard. At the time, I was staying with a friend of a friend, a decent guy named Robert. I think he had some intentions of making our relationship more than just roommates. When he came into the room to see what was wrong, I could tell he'd been drinking. When he saw the package, his anger flared, and before I could stop him, he stormed out. When Robert hadn't come back after a few hours, I started to worry, and I had every reason to. The nurses at the hospital were vague about the details, but had most of the story. Apparently, Robert had gone to confront Michael, and Michael had nearly beaten him to death. His face was disfigured, he had a concussion, several internal injuries, and his left femur was shattered. I was horrified. My problems were now affecting the people around me. At my next therapy session, I told my therapist what had happened. She began asking me questions about Michael, and I told her everything I knew. He was an only child with no family left, orphaned as a young teenager. I spoke of our young love, his dedication to me and the children, and the way he behaved during the two years he must have known about my affair. I also told her what Michael had done to Robert. When I finished, she looked scared. You need to leave, and as far away as possible. Don't call him, don't write, don't let him know where you are. There is no chance of reconciliation. Don't even try. Move on with your life. If you push him, the most likely outcome is that he'll kill you. Your actions have shattered a man who is already barely holding on to sanity. He's faced one disappointment after another his whole life. He will never forgive you. He will never forget. Run. So, I did. I ran from the memory of my once perfect life to a dumpy college town in Virginia, where I found an even worse job. Years later, I met a man who could tolerate me and ignore my past. The best I can say about him is that he didn't smell and didn't hit me. There was no love, just companionship. I'm certain it's all part of my punishment. My children reached out to me when they were older, just to check in and let me know they were alive and aware of my existence. They never asked to see me or include me meaningfully in their lives. As for Michael, he thrived without me. I kept up with his life through the news as much as I could. He was always a standout in the software industry and had immense wealth to show for it. There wasn't much written about his personal life. I saw him one last time at my daughter's wedding, and I was surprised to be invited. He looked incredible, every bit the man I once loved but had betrayed. I must admit, I felt a bit nervous when he approached me, ready for one final jab. For the record, you ruined my life first. He glanced at my small wedding ring, and at that moment, I wished I had never put it on. I'm glad you found someone. I hope he makes you happy. And then he was gone.